This cold, dark landscape may seem innocuous to you and me, if maybe a little unforgiving. It might even come across as beautiful in the eyes of some. But what we are looking at right now, believe it or not, is in fact a toxic, polluted wasteland. Ravaged by a specific kind of chemical waste that has destroyed 99% of all living things on this planet. In an event that calling it an extinction is an injustice. It is a catastrophe. This world is Earth, two billion years ago, before the evolution of animals, plants, fungi, even before the evolution of the most basic of multicellular life. This is, or was, a world of microbes. Right now, it is little more than a frozen desert in the grips of this planet's first mass extinction. Devastated by a chemical we can scarcely imagine life without. Right now it is 2.46 billion years ago. The solar system, and therefore the Earth, is much younger. The sun is noticeably dimmer than today. Earth itself is far from what we know it. Even more so today, most of the surface is covered by water, in the form of shallow seas. What little land there is, if there were any, would be nothing but sterile archipelagos of barren rock, bereft of any life whatsoever. The days are shorter, lasting only 18 hours compared to our modern 24, and the moon orbits closer, at least by 50,000 kilometers. It would not dominate the sky like in romantic fiction, but it would certainly appear noticeably bigger to an observer if they were any on the surface. Speaking of the surface, despite the dimmer sun, the Earth is a stinking, hot, toxic quagmire. The atmosphere, though thinner than today, would be a death sentence for anything living from our time. It consisted mostly of nitrogen, carbon dioxide and methane, and most notably, a distinct absence of free oxygen. This would act as a powerful greenhouse for the planet. Volcanism was a lot more common back then. The shallow seafloor was peppered with hydrothermal vents, which spewed a chemical soup rich in iron and hydrogen sulphide. Despite this, life, even during this time, was already an old feature on the young Earth. The ecology of Earth during this time was dominated by archaea, anaerobic microbes that predate nearly every other kingdom of life that we know of today, even bacteria. These microbes, however, are still very much living things, whereas the earliest forms of life straddled the line between living and simply being chemistry. Still, these microbes were extremely primitive, being prokaryotes, lacking a nucleus with a membrane, as well as other common organelles found in most cellular life today. They congregated in great microbial cities around the hydrothermal vents, feeding on the chemical soup spewed out by them. But their microbial mats only extended a little beyond the vents, and thus were relegated to small, overcrowded domains. However, this overcrowding soon became a blessing in disguise. This was before the days of predator and prey, and so these masses of archaea filled every nook and cranny they could for both space and the availability of their mineral diets. This high density in life forms meant that they could not help but exchange genetic information with each other as they inadvertently mixed their cell walls together, as fragments of DNA shifted from body to body. This led to a massive amount of evolution, adaptation and diversification within these colonies of primitive cells. So much so that it resulted in a revolutionary new adaptation to evolve that would change the face of the Earth forever. That adaptation was pigment. Without ozone, the Earth was bombarded with ultraviolet radiation, making the surface and shallow waters uninhabitable for even the hardiest microbes of the time. However, there still was a sweet spot in the shallows 
where there was still plentiful sunlight, but ultraviolet radiation was limited enough that the pigment allowed microbes to use the energy of the sun to metabolize chemicals in their bodies to produce food for themselves. This was the birth of photosynthesis. This photosynthesis, however, was different from what we know it today, in that it was still largely anaerobic. For one, the pigment was purple, not green like we know it, and it metabolized hydrogen sulfide, not carbon dioxide, and produced sulfur as a waste. So these new colonies of microbes were still cut from the same cloth as their chemosynthetic brethren around the hydrothermal vent cities. But photosynthesis did allow these microbes to conquer the waters beyond the vents, like flowers in the wasteland, the once dead seas blossomed with life. So profound was their evolution that Earth's oceans, once a somewhat turquoise green from the rich amount of iron in the water, soon turned purple from the presence of early photosynthesis. However, this new evolution would continue to diversify and thus would open new doors to life not yet seen before. Let's go back to present times for a little while. Across the globe, you might find strange rock formations that contain alternating lines of crimson inside. These strange rocks are not simply the result of some impurity from an ancient magma flow or some tectonic quirk. These banded iron formations, as they are known, are the fossil record of a cycle of life and death that permeated across the young Earth. Back to two and a half billion years ago, within the green and purple seas, a new breed of microbe has taken to the scene, cyanobacteria. These new organisms have developed a revolutionary new form of photosynthesis, using a green pigment, chlorophyll, that rather than using the hydrogen sulfide, uses the far more common carbon dioxide, allowing them to reach frontiers beyond their brethren. However, they produced a waste product far more deadly than inert and harmless sulfur. Oxygen. It is hard to imagine oxygen being deadly at all. In fact, it is hard to imagine life without it. The greenery around us produces it with abandon, and all animal life consumes it happily for their own biological functions. How could it be deadly? Well, one of the reasons is the same reason it is so useful to modern life. It is extremely reactive. It bonds and breaks down other compounds with relative ease. One only has to look at a rusting shipwreck or the Statue of Liberty being green rather than brazen copper to see oxygen's reactive power. The second reason being that during the time when cyanobacteria first took to the world stage, free oxygen was vanishingly scarce, and so the ecologies at the time were fully adapted to survive in a world without it. In fact, oxygen was directly toxic to life at the time, even the cyanobacteria that produced it. Oxygen was pollution for this world, and the cyanobacteria's early success meant that this pollution would defile all the seas of Earth at this time. If one was around at the time, the effects would not be hidden. They would be obvious to behold as the oceans turned from either a teal green or purple into a blood red. A play straight out of the Book of Exodus. But the red colouring would not be from blood, as life was clearly not complex enough to produce any. This colour is the result of the seas literally rusting. Earth's oceans at this time were astoundingly high in iron, and so when the free oxygen in the seas began to rise, this led to the increase of iron oxide. The rusting of the seas would lead to massive amounts of death, as it would obliterate the efficacy of photosynthesis, as well as upset the delicate chemical balance that these early life forms required not to mention the inherent toxicity of oxygen to these microbes. This devastation also found its way to the hydrothermal vent cities, choking and starving these fragile ecosystems of much needed nutrients. Eventually, the cyanobacteria colonies would be utterly decimated, bringing oxygen production to a halt. 
As they died, oxygen would decrease and the iron oxide would settle down to the ocean floor. For a while, these sediments would be covered by more common silica sediments, leading to the creation of the banded iron formations that we know of today. An eternal record of an extreme cycle of life of death across millions of years. As the red from the seas faded, cyanobacteria, knowing nothing of their own processes, would simply multiply again, produce oxygen, rust the waters, mostly die only to propagate as soon as the waters cleared, for eons. It seemed that life on Earth had settled on a deadly yet reliable set of seasons. Unfortunately, these seasons were reliant on the all too finite amounts of iron in these primordial waters. After millions of years since cyanobacteria took to the stage, the iron in Earth's seas had been depleted. But the need to photosynthesize and produce oxygen waste would continue unabated. As free oxygen increased in the oceans, they started to look all too familiar. While pleasant, maybe even relieving to human eyes, the microbes on Earth at the time, it was nothing short of a holocaust. Free oxygen resulted in the oceans becoming unbearably toxic for life. The early microbes were starved, strangled, and poisoned to death. From the shallows and shoals of the unliving continents to the deep hydrothermal cities, as oxygen reacted to the chemical deposits that their infrastructure depended on. Only the aerobic cyanobacteria were surviving. But even then, their success would spell even greater doom. Eventually, the amount of free oxygen that could be stored in the water had reached its zenith, and soon it began to leak into the atmosphere above. The sickly yellow of the sky would soon fade, and Earth would at long last claim its crown as the blue planet. But soon, the Earth, its early ecosystems destroyed, was going to be struck with a final, even greater calamity. Remember, at this time, Methane was a common gas in Earth's atmosphere. But methane, when mixed with oxygen, reacts to produce carbon dioxide and water. While today we are aware of carbon dioxide's power as a greenhouse gas, it is far weaker than methane. So the atmosphere, thanks to oxygen, had been turned into mostly carbon dioxide. This would normally evoke the image of a steaming sauna of a planet, but two billion years ago, the sun was far dimmer and thus cooler than it was today. And so, for the first and last time, carbon dioxide's ability to warm the planet would prove to be woefully inadequate. From pole to equator, Earth froze. Over the course of millions of years, a series of glaciations caused Earth to become a nearly featureless orb of ice. Cold, that the once hardy surviving microbes of a steamy hot Earth were not equipped to deal with. For all intents and purposes, Earth was just another dead planet, more in common with Mars than our home today. It cannot be overstated how devastating this freeze was. This event is considered the first true mass extinction in Earth's history. Deadlier than the KT impact that killed the dinosaurs. Even deadlier than the Permian extinction that was so apocalyptic, it is unironically thought of as the Great Dying. This is the oxygen catastrophe and it saw the destruction of 99% of all life on Earth. It tends to be overlooked due to the fact that much of the life at the time was far from charismatic like dinosaurs or synapsids. But regardless, these were ultimately some of our earliest ancestors, 
the roots of our tree of life, and it is sobering to see such death on such a scale that thankfully has not been seen today. All brought about by the very gas our lungs yearn for. Nothing remains, nothing but land and sea locked in ice, both sterile and lifeless. No sound except the wind, nothing of note under a dim and feeble sun. And yet today we are here, Despite the devastation, there was a sliver of hope. A precious few colonies of microbes had survived. Most of these were in small pools of warm water near areas of high geothermal activity that allowed significant numbers of cyanobacteria to carry on. There had also been a few hydrothermal colonies in the deep, where some anaerobic microbes continued to survive despite the cold oxygen-polluted waters. The glaciation was also not a singular event. There were many times where the primordial frost receded, no doubt providing a reprieve for life at the time. Eventually the glaciation subsided and the extreme conditions that it brought would soon serve as a crucible for some of the most incredible changes in life. One of the most profound was that cyanobacteria developed enzymes that allowed them to become tolerant to oxygen losing its status as a toxic pollutant. This was the result of cyanobacteria and other archaea sharing precious traits that enabled them to survive the glaciation. In fact, oxygen's toxic reactivity would soon become a boon for life in the future. What followed was an age known as the Boring Billion. Unfathomable amounts of time of calm and gentleness the Earth changed so little during this time, but life would flower in ways never seen before. We would see the rise of eukaryotic life, cells with more complex structures such as nuclei for DNA. Notably, this may have led to some archaea merging with these new critters to become mitochondria, unlocking new avenues for energy production in microbes and thus more fuel for more complex forms of life these avenues unlocked would allow sexual reproduction, the sharing of genetic information, allowing potential offspring to enjoy the strengths of their parents with weaknesses of neither. Predation, as some microbes sought sustenance from their lesser brethren, starting the predator and prey arms race that rages to this day. In this quiet after such a calamity, we would even start seeing the first true multicellular life as sibling microbes would begin to share the burden of survival with each other. And with the turning of eons, Earth's history would soon enjoy being filled with gardens of future past. From the Cambrian explosion, the Carboniferous forests, where oxygen levels would reach their zenith, mammal reptile kingdoms of the Permian, the Saurian empires of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, all the way across a thousand calamities and extinctions, where life is tested and triumphs to today. If there is a lesson to all of this, it is that life is both fragile and resilient, that even the most innocuous of things can lead to the greatest of calamities. The microbes of that time, like those today, were thoughtless, behaving exclusively on the programming of their genetic code. We are blessed in that we are aware of ourselves, our world and our place in it, and thus are unique in that we potentially have the strength and will to save ourselves, unlike those early critters, from catastrophes of our own making. <laughs>